Thank you for your encouragement and your support and your prayers regarding the preaching of God's Word. I'm always concerned about standing before you and declaring, thus says the Lord, looking for what might be just the right starting point and procedure and balance and wanting to improve for the future. And I welcome your suggestions and your ideas. But I have to tell you, as I'm thinking all the time, what else could I consider to implement and draw as part of the preaching of God's Word? Sometimes I just see something that so evident I think would be helpful to me, and that is this. As Tanya and I were shopping and looking on the spice aisle, you know, I'm thinking, what is there here? What do I need to be aware of? Maybe I, I hadn't seen before. And this sweet preacher is a sweet southern pork rub. Doesn't that just sound delicious? It's called the perfect blend of brown sugar and red spices and herbs. How do you blend brown sugar and red spices and herbs? And then the bottom it says fire and smoke. If ever a preacher needed this, we live in challenging times, don't we? We're going to stand firm on the Word of God and present it in a way that we pray will draw others to the light of the world about which David just read. And I think of these words in Colossians 4, 6 when the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, pray for me that God may open the door that I may speak the Word of God as I ought to speak. And then for all of us, he said, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. With grace, that's kind. Seasoned with salt, that's in good taste. Appropriate, fitted to each person person. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus declared this claim that one who's groping, one who's stumbling, one who's tripping up, one who can't see the way, who doesn't know what to do next, can come and, as Matt let us, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth grow strangely dim as we look into his face. What happens next? I think we've covered at least in some degree when Jesus talks about the truth that will set you free and that everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And then he declares that God is his father and that his enemies who oppose him, he says, your father is the devil. Well, you talk about blunt and strong. Because of their behavior and their words and their attitude toward him, accusing him of having a demon rather than presenting the message of heaven. And then that passage toward the end of chapter 8, if you're looking there, where he claims to be the I am of Exodus 3, the true God that had spoken to Moses. And he said, before Abraham was born, he didn't say I was, or I was born, or I started, but I am, the eternal I am. And so they picked up stones to kill him. Now this man born blind. And a controversy begins. First of all, with the question, why? Many Jews had come to conclude that birth defects were the result of sin. And some tied it back to Jacob and Esau, even before they were born, wrestling inside their mother. Or maybe God was punishing the parents, and that's why such a thing occurred. And to Jesus' followers, this was a theological question. This was a dilemma. We have to find the cause. What started this, the first domino, and therefore this man has never been able to see the light of day? Jesus turns from the cause to the cure, from the past to the present and future. And he asks instead, how can this glorify God? 
How could this situation, this dire circumstance, as terrible as it is, become something that shows the glory and the majesty and the power and the love of God? Perhaps all of us at one time or another ask the question, why? Why did I have to experience that? Why am I in this particular circle? Why did I get that? Why did this come to me? Why didn't this turn out better? And why, and why, and why? And it can be a good question. But Jesus Christ can take us to a place where God can be praised by the way we respond. And Jesus helped the disciples to see when he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But light can be seen through it. And as long as I'm in the world, I am, and he repeats again, the light of the world. We must work while it's day because night comes when no man can work. And this sense that Jesus was on a schedule, that his hour had not yet come, but it would. And he's got to redeem the time and make the most of right now. And we can't dilly-dally. We can't get sidetracked. We can't get off what we need to focus on. Here's a man who cannot see. Can you imagine pitch black darkness? Never witnessing a sunrise or sunset. Never seeing a mother's or father's face or the mountains or the stars at night. Never even seeing a good plate of food or a best friend, a smile or a tear. And wondering, what would it be like if my eyes were opened. Instead of fixing the blame, Jesus fixes the problem. Instead of discussing constantly that which they could not totally resolve, Jesus sends this man to the pool. And there he washes and receives his sight. It's simple. It's an act of faith. You know that someone had to lead him to Siloam, that he could not find his way there by himself, and that all of his life he couldn't take a step without feeling or following or holding on. I think of the difference between the man who went to the pool and the man who came back. It wasn't the same man. And no matter what Jesus' critics would do to accuse and castigate, they're going to tell this man, I think it's in verse 34, you were born in sins. Again, going back to his blindness. This is your fault. This is your problem. And all this that they heap on him, but they cannot silence him. And his message is so clear and it's so simple. I was blind, but now I see. Hey, you could be kicked out of the synagogue. You could be ostracized, excommunicated, shunned, denied the privilege of going to the Sabbath services. I was blind and now I can see. Jesus touched my eyes and he sent me and I washed in the pool and I came back seeing. Verse 7 notes Siloam, which is translated sent. There's a Hebrew word, shalak which means he sent. And it's from that word that this pool was named. You may not be able to see it very clearly, but the Gihon Spring to the right there of the screen, that's where the water originated. And then that kind of blue line curving actually goes under the city wall. And in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, in order to guarantee there would be a water supply if Jerusalem were ever attacked and surrounded by enemies. You can read in 2 Kings 20.20 20 and 2 Chronicles 32.30 that this tunnel, 1,800 feet, 
Archaeologists still can't explain how they began at the two opposite ends and met in the middle. How likely is that to happen? But they did, and they followed the turning of that wall. Hezekiah 715 to 686 BC. And because it was sent from the Gihon to Shaloah, Siloam, it was called sent because it had to come. And you might think of Jesus being sent. Or John 7, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And remember, I mentioned how the priest would go to the pool of Siloam and take the water the first seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles and, and pour it out. Jesus sent the blind man to the sent pool. And Jesus was the one who was sent from heaven. And when the man was asked, how did this happen to you? Oh, there were many things about Jesus he could not have answered. In fact, you'll see in chapter 9 a progression. He'll call him a man. Then he'll call him a prophet. But it's not till the end of the text that he recognizes he is God the Son and he is to be worshipped. He couldn't have told you all the specifics of Jesus' life, everything he had done, everything he had said, every person he had met, but what he knew he could tell. Brothers and sisters, I believe this with all my heart. I know you do too. We can tell about Jesus what we know. What he has done in our lives. What we read of him in his word. The light that we see that we never could have in any other way. There's a discussion going on, you can see, in verse 8. The neighbors, those who previously saw him as a beggar because that's the way he spent his life, what else could he do? He couldn't be productive. He couldn't hold down a job. He couldn't have a family. Even the things that many of us might take for granted Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Others were saying, no, he just looks like him. They had the same criteria of examination that we do. These weren't gullible, believe whatever comes down the pike. They said, hey, maybe there's been a switch here. Does this man have an identical twin? And they're going back and forth and back and forth. Who's going to settle that? I am the one. Love that. Who was blind? I was. Who couldn't find his way? That would, I would be the person. Who's the individual that was begging and now can see? Is that real? I was a beggar. Pockets empty. I didn't have anything. No income. No hope. No help. No life. And now my life has been given to me. Not given back, but given for the first time in the sense of this illumination. So they asked him, how then were your eyes opened? And he calls him the man. The man Jesus. That's what he knows about him. Made clay, anointed my eyes, and said, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. Well, where is he? I don't know. Then they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now they're going to call him before the judgment scene. Why? Because it's a Sabbath day and Jesus delights in showing that healing people and helping people and loving people and serving people is so proper every day of the week. But these religious officials would have had this man stay in his darkness another day. There's something about Jesus that we want to take over our hearts and lives. Not another day. Not another week. Not another hour. Well, can't you come back tomorrow? This is the Sabbath day. He applied clay to my eyes. I washed and I see. This man will tell his story at least three times. And finally, when they ask him, he'll say, you, want, you mean you want to hear it again? But he never gets tired of recalling what's happened to him. 
Some of the Pharisees, this man is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others are saying, if he's a sinner, how can he perform these signs? And there was a division among them. So they go back to the blind man. What do you say about him? Now he says he is a prophet. He's moved from he's a man to he's a prophet. You recall chapter 7, all of those opinions about Jesus. He's a good man. No, he's a deceiver. Could he be the prophet? Could he be the Christ? Well, he's from Galilee, and we thought the Christ would come from Bethlehem. And you see that spilling over here. Another image of that tunnel dug under Hezekiah's orders, again, coming down from the Gihon Spring to the pool of Siloam. You can visit that tunnel today. That's the image on the left there. You can walk through the tunnel, if like me, you're willing to bring it in a little bit, sort of tight. And you can imagine this man going there, and you know, it's grace, obedient faith, and deliverance. It's such a graphic image of how God saves people. I'm blind, I admit it, I'm not going to whitewash it, I'm not going to explain it away. I'm blind. Admitting sin and then going to the pool to wash, it's an act of faith. Easy to compare it to baptism because something is going to happen. The power's not in that pool, it's not in this baptistry, but God's power is received at that moment at that time when this man goes to the pool or when one is immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, it's, it's by grace. It's through faith that obeys. And then what comes after that? A story to tell, a world to reach. Others who are still groping and stumbling in darkness and the issue with them may be that they don't know it. And that's what's coming at the end of this chapter because there's none so blind as he who will not see. And the Pharisees who claim to have it all worked out are the ones who in fact are deluded and whose vision what would be like to be this man. The mud's on your eyes that Jesus made. You still can't see. And as you go down, and if you could feel with this man what that might have been like, and then there's water. Maybe that's the first thing he sees. And then he looks up, and he, the reflection of the sun, and, and maybe these people over on the side, and maybe he sees his own reflection. We don't know. They want the proof. And they begin to use every tool in the box to try to find fault with what Jesus has done for this man. I made myself a list. Verse 15, interrogate the blind man to find a flaw. Verse 16, deny that Jesus is from God on some other basis. You can keep our rules. Verse 18, refuse to believe the man's irrefutable testimony. 18 to 23, interrogate the blind man's parents. And it doesn't stop there. They go and question him again. They insult him for believing. They claim to have all the right answers. And they harass him and they kick him out of the synagogue. This man paid a price for his obedience to Christ. Was it worth it? Leaving behind what he had known. Perhaps others had carried him or brought him to the synagogue every week and now he's shut out. But where's the darkness? Is the darkness out there where he's following Jesus or is the darkness in that synagogue where so many would not see the light? So... Where's the proof? Tell us one more time what happened. And let's see if we can't somehow undermine and undercut what you're telling us about Jesus. 
And so the man goes through and tells them. It's undeniable. It's unmistakable. And one of the many reasons I believe the Word of God to be inspired and without error is that here's a case when even the critics could not negate the fact that the man was blind. He hadn't seen them all his life, but they had seen him. And now they cannot refute the fact that his eyes are open. And so they may try to find some other cause. Remember how they would tell Jesus, you're casting out demons by the prince of the demons? But they could not erase the absolute evidence of what had happened. And so, what do you say about him? Well, he's, he's a prophet. Verse 18, they don't believe him. So they call the parents and question him, is this your son who you say was born blind? And you know what they're probably hoping for? Parents say, no, no, it's not. It didn't happen. It's a fraud. It's a fake. We have the answer. One of you came to me a few days ago and said, Corey, could it be that this man born blind was younger than what you see in the picture like this? Since they asked the parents, was he a, a young adult where they're going to say in a moment, he's of age, ask him. And they're doing that to dodge the bullet, to throw it off of themselves so they won't, they're intimidated, they're afraid. Hey, we, we would be rejected from our fellow Jews. So how can we toss the hot potato? Go back and ask him. He's of age. Well, we don't know how old he was. He was old enough to speak for himself, but he was young enough that they still went to the parents, at least for identification. Notice again the same criteria that people would use today. Verse 20, we know that this is our son. And he was born blind. But how it happened, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He can speak for himself. Why did they say that? They were intimidated. Afraid of the Jews that they would be put out. What's the difference between the parents and the son? They know it happened. But he is the one to whom it happened. Why is he willing to be castigated and cut off. And his parents are trying to avoid that happening at all costs. It's because he was the one in darkness. And you can try to shut his mouth, but you can't do it. You can threaten him with whatever you might bring to bear. He's still going to say, I was blind. He sent me to the pool. I washed and now I can see. Who is this man, Jesus? Ed's reminded us with the Lord's Supper today and Matt and the singing of these hymns and in our prayers that ultimately it's all about Jesus. Every element of Scripture and of life, someone said, if Jesus is the answer, what's the question? And one response would be, it doesn't matter what the question is. He is the answer, as Steve Miner reminded us Wednesday night, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And this entire one series going on midweek all summer long brings us back to that uniqueness of Jesus. That's why we call this series, He's the One. Well, look at verse 24. Again, glorify God. We're not going to question that you're healed, but don't give any credit to Jesus. He's a sinner. Whether he's a sinner, the man says, I don't know. There's much he doesn't know about it, but this is what I know. And here we go again, like an endless loop. What did he do to you? Verse 27, I told you, you won't listen. Do you want to hear it again? And then perhaps a note of sarcasm. You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Ooh, can you imagine how that's going to bring a reaction from them? Oh, now wait a minute. And so they revile him. You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And so they think they have it all neatly tucked away. God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man is from. Now in chapter 7, 
They said, we do know where he's from. He's from Galilee, and he ought to be from Bethlehem, which we know he was born in Bethlehem. On the one hand, when it suits them, we know where you're from. You can't be the Messiah. And now, we don't know where this man's from. The man answered, it's amazing. It's amazing. You think he's going to say, it's amazing I was in darkness and now light. But he says, you don't know where he's from. And yet he opened my eyes. God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He hears Him. All of us are sinners. Obviously, God hears us when we pray through Christ. Cornelius, the centurion we mentioned in class, he was not yet a Christian when his prayers were heard. When this blind man says God doesn't hear a sinner's prayer, he's talking about a person that is habitually practicing sin, who's desiring to be disobedient to God, who's pushing back against the will of God. And this man makes the simple point, if Jesus is that kind of person, why did God hear him and open my eyes? It's never been heard. One born blind, a person could open his eyes. If he weren't from God, he could do nothing. And we talked about inference and implication in our Bible class this morning. This man is inferring He's drawing from what's happened, just as we do, that Jesus Christ is the perfect, spotless, innocent, amazing Son of God. And the things He did, which are undeniable, indisputable, irrefutable, He could not have done if He weren't from God. Do you remember way back in John 3, Nicodemus, the ruling Pharisee that came to Him as night, we know you're a teacher sent from God, he said, John 3, 1 and 2, because no one could do these signs if God were not with him. That's when they, the Pharisees here at chapter 9, 34, you were born entirely in sins. And are you teaching us? You can feel the haughtiness, the arrogance. What do you have that, that we don't know already? And they've already judged him. This matter of prejudice is a terrible Thing. To look at someone from the outside and make a decision, an evaluation about who they are or where they've been or what might be in their heart. And sadly, that's another important takeaway from this message today is to fight that urge to judge the book by its cover and to offer hope and peace and forgiveness to all in darkness. Who is this man? Jesus asked the one that was healed, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he that I may believe in him? And Jesus told him, you've seen him, he's the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Worship is only given to deity. And here's another pointer to the fact that this man, Jesus, is no mere man. The blind man started out calling him a man. Then he called him a prophet. And then he said he's a miracle worker. And now the Son of Man, which was another designation for the Christ. And this worshiping that carried on, uh, carried the idea of obeisance, homage, uh, bowing down to kiss the hand or even the feet of of. of the Lord. Jesus heard. And Jesus said, verse 39, I've come for judgment. Those who don't see may see, and those who see may become blind. It's a paradox. The one who says, my life is dark. I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing. I can't see the way unless Jesus opens my eyes. That's the person with 20-20 vision. On the other hand, one who, like these critics, denies the darkness and the guilt and the sin is the one who is truly blind. Before you can see, you must admit that you cannot 
See, as long as you think you can see, Jesus said you're still blind. Your sin remains. When you go to the pool, which we've compared to baptism, God allows you. God takes away your sin. God opens your eyes. And then, like this man, here's the message. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. If you can say, Jesus opened my eyes, what do you see differently because you met him? That's where you begin as you talk to others. This man, Jesus had blessed him, provided for him, given him his life. And he eagerly then wanted his whole world to know. Let me ask you, are you blind? Or can you see? Have you blinded yourself to your need to repent? To yield? To surrender to Jesus Christ? Are you able to see your desperate state without Him and your salvation with Him? Have you been to the pool? And do you have a story to tell? Won't you come? Let's stand and sing.